Hop up here, have a seat, Justin. See, my money won't take a picture. Of you. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Justin's going to be the mayor, mayor for the day here. All right, before, before we get started, we got a work session tonight. I'm going to let Justin help lead the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Justin, if you want to turn around here, stand up here. And, uh, stand up. Flag, can you help me lead? Do you hear me right? There you go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and a God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Justin. All right, buddy, come on in here. All right, are we on? Good, e good evening, everyone. Welcome here. Me and Justin are going to run this meeting tonight. Welcome to the May 13th, 2019 regularly scheduled work session. Tonight we've got two items on our agenda. Public comment is allowed that is germane to an agenda item. If you wish to speak, you're required to fill out a public comment card and turn it into the city clerk before the, ag before the agenda item has been read. If you are speaking on behalf of an organization, you must fill out an affidavit that you have that you have the authority of said organization. Please remember this is not a time to engage the mayor or members of city council in the co conversation. When your name is called, please come forward and speak into the microphone stating your name and address for the record. The public comment will be allowed for a total of 10 minutes per agenda item and no more than two minutes per person. Public comment will be heard at the beginning of each item. Once the item is called, no other public cards will be accepted. So, Sudi, if you will please sound the first agenda item. Our first item is discussion of the Deerfield Highway 9 Economic Development and Marketing Study. Ms. Sarah Ladart. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Ryan and Kyle are here again from RKG. They were here at the last work session to engage you and ask you questions about your uh, vision for Deerfield and what you would like to see. And they've compiled that data or that information along with the conversations we had with Milton business owners and developers and real estate brokers, um, as well as just general data that they collected. Um, and they're here tonight to present that to you. And I'm going to take notes over here. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. It's great to see you all again. Uh, for those who don't remember, uh, I am Kyle Talenti. I am a vice president and principal with RKG Associates. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we are the consultants. Uh oh, I just lost my screen. Oh, okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going, I don't remember that well. Um, so we're here to, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the market analysis work that we've done, um, kind of give you some of the background information. Have, if you all remember, uh, the goal of all this is to come up with a strategy of how uh, to see that Deerfield Parkway study area um, develop into the future. And so... The obvious first step for us always is to make sure that everybody has a, the same understanding of the market dynamics that are influencing not just Milton, but uh, Georgia 400 and, and the North Fulton County region. Because without understanding those market realities, it's difficult to set a strategy forward that is achievable. Before we jump into the information, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned, uh, what's happening in the market, and then how that inf uh, uh, what that means for the Deerfield Parkway area, and before we jump into that, I kind of have a little bit of an icebreaker with all of you. Um, as always, if you have a question, please feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to answer questions as I go through it. I'm also happy to answer them at the end, so please don't, don't hesitate to, to point it out. But I kind of have an icebreaker that I want to hear from each of you uh, before we get into the, into the discussion. So as you see on the screen, the question is, in which existing employment center within Metro Atlanta would you want to work? And let's start with at 25 years old. So if you were 25 years old or when you were 25 years old, if you haven't quite hit 25 years old, imagine what it would be like to be 25. 
which of the existing employment centers in this region do you think you would most enjoy working at and why? Perimeter. And why is that? Because that's where it's all happening. And what is all to you? Uh, it has access to those things that I would be most interested in. So restaurants, um, uh, good employers, so like UPS and, and the other guys, Oracle and other folks that are located right in and around there. It's high population density as well. So there's a preponderance of townhomes and condos and things like that that would lead me to be able to live the lifestyle I think I would be living when I was 25. <laughs> I can't remember back that far. But. Excellent. Who else? Yeah, I appreciate I'd the answer. I'd probably be the opposite because I, when I was 25, I bought my farm and wanted to be in the middle of nowhere without all that stuff. But uh, so I would, uh, I would probably rather be in Milton back 25 years ago the way I was there. So. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Excellent. Good. Who else? I want to hear from all of you. You can go in order. We can go around the room. I don't care how it works. I have several young nephews and nieces that are living now in Buckhead. So I know that Buckhead is probably the new swinging place to live. So um, I, and I maybe would have liked to live there for a while back and what then. And what makes it a swinging place to live? Well, there's lots of, well, there's um, housing that is affordable in that age. Um, there's lots of things to do. Um, and the work, you, most of them are working down there, and they don't want to be in traffic and commuting. Excellent. What's your uh, question? What's your idea of affordable housing? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all living with roommates. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's, it's affordable to them. It's all relative. Right? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> all four of them in a two-bedroom. <laughs> I'd probably say the same thing. I'd probably look at Buckhead or Perimeter. I mean, Cox Communication, there's a lot of employers between those two areas, but down in that area at that age. But I also think from a affordability and housing, I would be, when I was 25, I did have roommates or a roommate. So I'd be sharing the expense. It would, it would not be because that's the most affordable place to live. Sure. Anybody else? Justin, where would you want to live when you're 25? <laughs> question. The moon. Mars. Yeah. <laughs> the moon. <laughs> well, you, Justin, you think about that when you're ready. You let me know. <laughs> Who else? Who else? I mean, when I was 25, I lived in the uh, villages of Devonshire Apartments on Deerfield Parkway when I married my wife. So I was right there at that point in time. Okay. And then Excellent. Was was three years ago, Matt. <laughs> 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 All right, Justin's got it. Go ahead. All right, Justin. Florida. Florida. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'm not sure we can recreate Florida here, but I appreciate that response. Anyone else? How about when you were 40, or how about as a 45 year old? Does your answer change? Is the place where you would want to work, the employment center you'd want to work at, does that change? Maybe not for Joe. Joe wants to farm, and I get that. That pretty much stays consistent. <laughs> I think by 45, you have. Some most families are, you know, have kids and they're looking at school systems and um, things like that. So, yeah, I lived in Milton when I was forty-five. So, yeah. and I, I did exactly what I thought I would do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I lived here also when I was forty-five. Moved here when I was thirty-eight. So, we wanted this area back then. Still do. Just out of curiosity, as a 45 or 38-year-old, would you be able to afford to live here now if you were moving here today as a 45-year-old um, with, with where you were at that point in time in your life? If, if, income, if income adjusted, still working for corporate, yeah, I think it would be okay. able to. Fair enough. Anyone else, 45, even if you haven't hit it yet? Well, I was going to say, as, as Longoria so eloquently said, I haven't yet hit 45, but I do live where I am now, so which is the north end of the city. So now remember, it's not where you're living. It's where do you want to work? Where well, do you want to work at for employment center? Would you want to work at as a 45 year old? I want to get as further out as possible. Give me a big old farm and get away from the traffic. Well, a lot of things have changed since I was 45 because yeah. telecommuting wasn't as big know, of a deal. Fair Technology enough. Technology has come a long way that enables Excellent. Uh, remote working and things like that. I mean, we picked. Um, what at the time was Alpharetta and Roswell's location for our offices because we thought we could attract the right level of technology resources 
uh, to engage in a daily commute to an office. Yep. And those rules have really changed quite a bit since then. So I, I don't know that it would be that impactful. So we would have a little bit more flexibility in terms Excellent. of where we located. Okay. But you know, one thing I'll add to that too, what's, what's nice about the Milton area and you bring Alpharetta and, and you know, on our east side of Milton is you can have, you can have a mix, you, you know, you can be five minutes away you can have a small farm or whatever, or be out in a, yep. a rural area and, and, but still have all the amenities of, uh, your work, work. What uh, about it? What about at 65? Does your work interests change now? Obviously everybody, hopefully at that point in time was thinking about retirement, but, um, how about towards your, your, Golden years, if you will, in the workforce. Where, where you want to work, does that change? Not necessarily where you live, mind you. It's where do you want to work? Walmart. <laughs> Greeter. <laughs> Greeter. I want to work out of my home office. Yep. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Anyone else? No, I, oh, go ahead, please. A lot of people who are turning 65 are trying to, if they leave Milton, they're going somewhere north, and mainly the data connections are allowing them to do exactly that. So yep. those are expanding. Fair. Well, and I appreciate that. So the purpose of that, the purpose of that question really was around understanding if we truly want to become an employment center destination, we have to respect and understand the desires of all stages of the work life is that there isn't very many companies out there that can thrive on just people who are 45 to 65 years old. Uh, even the companies out here in the, in the uh, North Fulton County market, when you get further away from Sandy Springs, a number of them have uh, workers that are living down further closer to the Buckheads and the perimeters and then coming up here for work because they can't afford to be here. And my point of all this is, is that as we get into this discussion, hopefully you'll, you'll piece together when we start talking about this information. We can't just look at it from maybe where we are right now in our life cycle, but we have to understand the decision-making factors that companies have to go through uh, as they're deciding where they're going to locate. Because when you talk about as a 25-year-old, the common thread was close to amenities, close to services, walkable where I don't have to commute a lot. And those things are very, very important. And when you, when you have a region, and we're going to talk about this in a bit, where tech and information is the largest employer of the region, and when we talk to businesses and they tell us that we opened our offices in North Fulton because that's where a lot of our engineers had located and a lot of our high end, higher end technicians had located, and so we wanted to have an office close by, those are some of the decision points that are coming into the marketplace. Now we're starting to learn that it's not just where the office is proximate to the house. It's where the office is with amenities and services near the office. How can we be competitive to keep them there so they don't have to get in their car to go get lunch? And they don't have to get in their car to go get their, pick up their dry cleaning. And they no longer have the time, the 30 or the 45 or the 60 minutes during lunchtime to go somewhere. And if any of you have ever been on Deerfield Parkway at lunchtime, you know you're not getting a whole, a whole lot for 15 minutes. 15 minutes out, 15 minutes back doesn't get you very far. And so when you look at development patterns that are going on in, in North Fulton County and even what's going on up in Forsyth County, you can see how the patterns of development and interest and investment are changing from what they were when you moved here when you were 45 and what Alpharetta and, and, and uh, uh, Roswell and even the perimeter have, have changed in terms of what the development focus has been. So with all that, um, there's a substantial amount of research that has gone into all this information, and I'll be happy to share the boring tables with you if you'd like, but I figured we'd uh, uh, boil it down to the Cliff's Notes version so we can get through this and all of you stay awake for the conversation at the end. Um, Milton is almost exclusively residential. Uh, I don't think that's any surprise to anybody. About 60% land is, is uh, currently used as residential. Another 30% is ag-based but with residential uses on it. Most of what's left is either wooded, undeveloped land that's zoned for residential, open and park space, and publicly held land. Uh, according to the, the, the planner, uh, less than 2% of the land here in the city is earmarked for non-residential uh, private sector development. Uh, that's substantial, particularly when we're talking about Deerfield Parkway, because that's where the preponderance of that 2% is located. Talking about the importance of it as an employment center option, if that's something that the city has interested in. <clears throat> Obviously, and then the others are, are Crabapple and Birmingham. So these are just some graphics to show you uh, in, in visual form what we just talked about. You can see here just residential uses. The next graphic integrates the agricultural that has residential components and then the public recreation spaces. So you can see 
just kind of from a visual perspective, how much of the city is, is uh, dedicated to those uses. Not a bad thing, but a, an important factor when we talk about what is the future of Deerfield Parkway for the community. Um, the surrounding jurisdictions have employment centers clustered on the city's edge. Obviously, Alpharetta on the, uh, uh, the east side of 400. Um, even Forsyth County is now getting into the game. Uh, someone mentioned earlier, I think it was uh, 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 Councilman Kuntz said, you know, the technology with the, the uh, uh, data transfer uh, infrastructure that's being put up there is allowing development to continue to move further and further out. The um, uh, way I like to explain it is, you know, North Fulton County really kind of started with Roswell back in the 70s and 80s, and as the rest of North Fulton continued to develop, the, the economic center point has continued to move up Georgia 400 as more investment has gone on in Milton and Johns Creek and Alpharetta. Well, and now it's going to continue to move further north as Forsyth County gets into the game. And so the reality is that, that our overall market area that influences what happens in this part of Metro Atlanta isn't just North Fulton anymore. It definitely has grown beyond just our borders. Um, however, Deerfield Parkway is more part of that 400 development ecosystem than it really is the rest of the city of Milton. And you saw those graphics. The intensity of developments even around it within the city of Milton, with the activity that's going on, investment interest reflects more what's happening elsewhere than it does in the other 98% of the city of Milton. And that's important to understand from an investment potential perspective, is people don't look at that as what I would call the traditional Milton development area. They look at that as a Georgia 400 employment center opportunity. And that's important when we start talking about what the potential uses that can go there and then what the potential mix of uses will be most appropriate to try and spur that investment. The five mile radius surrounding Deerfield Parkway, there are 120,000 jobs. Um, 20,000 are in professional technical services, 13,000 in information, 12,000 in administrative support, another 12,000 in wholesale trade. I'm sure we talked about this last time I was here, the, the nomenclature transaction alley for the Georgia 400 corridor. All these are things that are influencing the types of businesses that are locating up here. As I mentioned when we talked about that icebreaker question, a lot of the, the employment in these industry sectors are younger folks. There is a concentration of those middle age, middle management, upper management folks, but the preponderance of jobs are folks that are of that younger ilk that are looking for a different kind of lifestyle than I am at 45 or and, and what we've kind of talked about where we are in, in our life stages. Um, this is just a graphic kind of showing you where the employment clustering is going on. Uh, the dark line that kind of comes down, I don't know if you can, does my mouse point? Yeah, so this is, this is the county boundary right here. And so you can see that employment development clustering going on out up in Forsyth County is, is there and is going to continue to expand. Halcyon is just in an infancy stage and is going to create another employment center destination within the Georgia 400 corridor. But you can see here we are part of a much larger employment destination. The market realities, once again, for our study area are a little bit different than what I would say for traditional for the city of Milton. Um, the, the Deerfield Parkway area is really your only chance to capitalize on that large-scale employment growth strategy. Um, not only is it the preponderance of your commercial space, it's also there's a number of very large, undeveloped, and substantially underdeveloped parcels for the potential of what it can be. And so as we go through this exercise, not just today, but through the rest of the analysis, even some of the properties that are already developed, rethinking what the potential is there, and then how do we engage with those property owners to bring them on board, to want them to see the vision that we've established. And so that's going to be a big part of what comes out at the back end of this, is because it's not just the 80 or so acres that are undeveloped now, it's truly the entire site has greater potential than what it's currently being used for. And you, you'll see, and we'll talk about in just a minute, within the office market, even areas in Alfreda and Roswell and even at Perimeter, they are trying to rethink infill development because of that competitive, that lack of competitive edge of not having the mixture of housing and services and amenities mixed in with those jobs. Um, if you look at some, even some of the developments going on in Perimeter now, it's a lot of it is infill development. So this is the graphic showing the location of the non-residential land available within the city of Milton. You can see it's a stark contrast to the other graphics that we had shown uh, a little while ago. So um, in terms of talking about the workforce here, about 95% of Milton residents who are employed commute out of the city for, for their jobs. And the more interesting factor for me is 
it's a similar dynamic for in commuting. Um, you have about 90% of your workforce that works here in the city comes from elsewhere, and you have 95% of your existing <coughs> workforce goes elsewhere. So right off the bat, for me, there's an opportunity there is how do we create strategies to incent or to attract our existing workforce, whether it be the person who owns the business or the people who work for those businesses, to create opportunities here within the city of Milton. So that's one of the first things is, and then from a competitive perspective is, how do we provide opportunities for those folks who are working here now to maybe become part of the community? Um, we are, our, our residential development is very homogenous. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. And so, but the reality is, is the, those folks who work here that have the ability to also live here, it's much more likely that they'll want to stay at their jobs. It's much more likely that they'll invest in the community long term. And it's much more likely if they ever have an idea that spins off into another business that they'll operate it here in the city of Milton rather than taking it back down to the perimeter or taking it down to Buckhead or into Midtown. So this is just a graphic kind of showing you the actual numbers around the in-commuting, out-commuting that's going on. You can see here it's, it's, a, it's a very, very small amount. Only 876 people, according to the census, live in the city of Milton and also work in the city of Milton. That is not typical. It is typical that more than half of people commute in and more than half of people commute out. It is not typical that 90% to 95% commute in and commute out. So once again, to me, there's an opportunity there. But it's also reflective of the fact that there's, there's, it's not just the ability to bring the folks who work here, especially if they own the business, because they have employees that would have to come with them as well. And that could be a challenge. I would uh, say, going back to those numbers, that the workers that commute into Milton surprises me. I don't know if that does anybody else, that number. It, yeah, because the makeup of that, I mean, obviously we have a couple of employers that are high concentration employee employee centers but i gotta imagine the bulk of that is retail yes and that seems to be an awful lot of retail it's a lot of jobs but actually you know what there are some like that have like five thousand so that's probably like the, that's half of it yeah well no i'm counting verizon as one of the yeah. employers but yes i mean you do have some very large retailers yeah. along yeah. nine and in that deerfield corridor area and uh, we did learn in terms of folks that are commuting in, there are folks from Cherokee and, and Forsyth County, but also there's a large portion of folks that are coming up from Sandy Springs, Roswell, the perimeter. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination of you have to go out to be able to afford, especially if you're working at an entry level or a, or a more service-based job. And especially for young people who want to be near where the action is and those services, they are forced to choose an area like Sandy Springs or Perimeter, because that's really where the closest of that that they can afford to be in is located. And I think you see that every every morning because people getting off on Windward Parkway, a bunch of them will go to the, the east, to Alpharetta, but then there's a bunch going there, but it's backed up on 400. It never used to be that way, but now there's all the traffic coming north, just like there's traffic going south. Yep. Every day. Well, and, and I guess my point to that is when, when you see Forsyth County is getting more and more into the game, that's just going to continue. And so the conversation I've had with, with not just here in, in, in North Fulton County, but everywhere is we're not building more roads generally, particularly collector roads that are able to move large numbers of people. And so if we want to try and mitigate some of that impact, even just for our residents, providing people the alternative to not have to live all the way down in uh, the perimeter to come up to to Johns Creek or up to Forsyth County, but having the opportunity to do it here, which then also creates some of those amenities for our existing residents. And that's another thing that we heard through this, the conversations is, be, gee, we really wish we had a better restaurant scene. We really wish we had a better destination, amenity-rich location for us to use here within our community. And so it kind of serves two purposes. It helps create that opportunity to strengthen the, the, the uh, potential for new businesses here, but then it also creates an amenity for our residents that at least some that we've talked to, and I'm not going to say it's universal, but some that we have talked to said we really wish we had more of that stuff here rather than having to go down to, um, to, um, you know, to Roswell or to Sandy Springs or to Canton Street or something like that. And so, it, it, yes, I, I would say, yeah, that's definitely something to consider, that that traffic going both ways is, is not a, a, a one and done. That's going to be a phenomenon that stays. Um, uh, what's happening in the market from a residential perspective of no surprise to anybody? 
Uh, North Fulton County has continued its post-recession surge. Everybody got hit hard during the, the recession in the mid-2000s, not just here in, in Atlanta, but throughout the United States. Um, however, not every area has recovered like North Fulton County has, and where I live in, in the Metro Washington, D.C. area, and has recovered and has now has exceeded where we were back then. Um, the impact of that has caused prices to continue to escalate both on the rental side and on the ownership side, and even on the ownership side, both on resale and new construction. And so you see those prices continue to climb because supply can't meet demand. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those numbers in a minute. Um, for in, in terms of the development, not necessarily for traditional subdivision development, but employment center-based development really has moved into the mixed-use realm. It's become too expensive to develop, particularly for the cost of land, to be able to develop standalone individual uses anymore, just an office complex or just a retail center. Um, and so that, that, that mix of demand or that mix of uses is how you mitigate the cost of acquisition, a lot of times demolition because there's not a whole lot of uh, green fields left in North Fulton County, and then the ability to, to put more property, more development in. Um, it also is something that communities, some communities are choosing for the diversification of housing stock, is that, yes, you know, we understand the value and the need for high-value homes and ownership, but they, rec they recognize the fact that from an economic perspective, if you don't have a diversified housing stock, it's, it's impossible to create that continuum of living. You, you mentioned earlier that you rented here at 25 years old and got married, and now you bought here and you live here. That continuum of lifestyle is very common. And you are not an, an outlier in that regard. People tend, if they like the area where they're living, they will tend to find that lifestyle. And so, um, and then from companies, like I mentioned earlier, not every 25-year-old can afford uh, half a million or three quarters of a million or a million dollar home. And frankly, most 25-year-olds don't want that big lot. I know when I was giving it to you from my perspective, the last thing in the world I wanted to do at 25 years old was get up on a Saturday morning and have to go mow my acre and a half of land. That was so far out of my mindset at that point in time that it's not even funny. And so um, the reality of that diversification of housing is another option that's out there. And whether we like it or not, uh, in our research we learned there is an emerging divorcee and empty nester market that also doesn't want to be in those large homes anymore. They're looking for something smaller. Uh, a lot of what's going on down in Alpharetta, um, um, why am I blanking on it? And Avalon is, retire, is retirees, empty nesters, and mid-age divorcees. Most of what we've learned anecdotally through the renters there aren't 20 and 25 and, and 30 year olds. It's 45, 50, and 55 years old or even older that are either living on their own again or they are scaling down because they don't want to be in a large house anymore. And so there's a whole market out there that, that and as the baby boomers continue to age and folks want to, don't want to have those big properties or those big homes anymore, is a big market out there that we can take advantage of. <clears throat> so this is just a kind of a graphic uh, to give you a little bit of understanding of the home values. Uh, you, Milton is the orange line uh, tracking right here. You can see the impact of the economic downturn and then the strong recovery. I found it interesting that Sandy Springs tends to have higher home values, higher rent values, both single family and townhome and condo, as well as rental. Um, it goes to show what it tells me, which is not uncommon, is areas that have that concentration of live, work, play actually tend to be more desirable across the spectrum, not just from the young folks, but from folks who also want to have access to those services. And so the prices are obviously uh, reflective of the fact that there's a substantial amount of demand. And with Sandy Springs not having as much newer construction as Milton, um, it's, it's just a testament to the fact that when you have those concentration of services, it makes the community a more high demand community. Oops. How did I go backwards? So the office market, as I mentioned a little bit while ago, the office market is experiencing a dynamic shift. Um, the resurgence of downtown and midtown Atlanta really has changed the marketplace. A lot of businesses, and this is not just Metro Atlanta, but nationwide, a lot of companies are saying, you know, we no longer want the suburban campus for all the reasons that we talked about earlier. And you're seeing a resurgence of investment and interest in those more urbanized, walkable, scaled uh, amenity-rich areas, access to transportation, and you're seeing that. And that is having an impact on the North Fulton County market. I mentioned a little while ago Avalon. Avalon was the first speculative office development in North Fulton County in over a decade. 
and they're charging rents that are 50 to 75 percent higher than the other Class A here in the North, County, North Fulton County market. And they are not only drawing new tenants to the marketplace, but they're attracting long-term tenants out of their existing buildings into Avalon. And the feedback that we're getting from the, the real estate community is companies are getting more efficient with their use of space. So instead of having 175 square feet per employee, they're dropping down to 125 square feet per employee. But they know that it's going to be a lot easier to attract employees when you're on top of all those amenities, when you have all those resources stacked right underneath them. And so the dynamic, not only just from developments, you know, the, the strength and, and size of midtown and downtown, but even developments like that are having a tremendous dynamic shift on your marketplace here in North Fulton County. And Halcyon is going to have a similar effect, though not as densely packed as Avalon, th that's going to be the direction that investment is going. And we, you see what's going on at North Point Mall with the, the transition to trying to develop some residential as part of the mall property. Communities are looking to, and I know I, I, I've, I've worked and I've uh, I stayed in touch with my former clients in Roswell, even there is looking at how do we do infill development? How do we find ways to get those amenities into our suburban scale office developments so that people don't have to drive off property to be able to get lunch or get um, or get uh, 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 um, dry goods or get their dry cleaning done. And so you're going to see that shift. And even when we interviewed some of the, the property managers here in the Deerfield Parkway, they were talking about how they are looking to repurpose portions of their building to try and create loft style office space, to try and put in better dining or better uh, amenitization for their tenants. Now they're struggling from the standpoint of trying and do it inside the building because the, the costs don't bear out, but they also were, seemed very, very interested in how they can better utilize the land that they're on to do infill development around them to make their properties more attractive. So this is not just something that we're looking at theoretically Metro Atlanta region-wide or North Fulton County is. It's impacting us right here in our study area in terms of these property owners recognize the fact that as more and more development moves to that mixed-use paradigm, they're going to be struggling to compete in the marketplace. And so from our perspective is, when we look at Deerfield, the study area, it's not just about those large lots that are undeveloped, but then how do we get smarter with incentivizing or allowing more development on the properties that we already have so that we can keep the spaces that we have occupied? Because it's not just about new, it's about making sure that what we have is going to remain competitive in the marketplace. Um, we talked all about the, the efficiency of space exacerbating that trend. You know, 20 years ago, it was between 200 and 250 square feet per office worker. And now up here in North Fulton, we're being reported of 125 to 200 to 150. So if you think about that, in 20 years, that 100,000 square foot building is employing twice the number of people as it did when it was built. So if you don't see in 20 years a doubling of your employment you're actually seeing increase in vacancy. And this is, like I said, this is not just here. This is uh, uh, North Fulton County. It's happening nationwide. Companies are trying to get more efficient with their use of space to reduce their costs. If you ever heard the term cube farm, and I can't imagine you haven't at this point in time, that whole uh, movement came out of the fact of companies trying to figure out a way to better utilize space and, and be able to put more employees in the same amount of square footage. Um, so these are just some of the images, you know, uh, of projects. Obviously, the two on the right um, uh, are of whoops, excuse me, of crab apple uh, development here. And so we we put that one up to say, even within this small environment, you're starting to see that movement towards rather than just a separation of uses, but mixing the office with the retail with the residential. It may not be in the same building per se, but even in a small scale like crab apple, this is the direction that investment is going. And to, to, from our perspective, for the Dealerfield Parkway, if we're not thinking about that, um, when we look at how do we want this area to develop in the future, we're going to be severely limiting the potential for what will happen there. Um, so we talked about the speculative development, about Avalon being um, the first in 15-plus years. Um, I already talked a lot about that. The strong regional job growth is driven by those tech-based companies that we talked about. Um, and and <clears throat> uh, those companies are seeking to have a presence near where the labor force is living. And we were told that a number of times. We spoke to a number of tenants, not just landlords, but we also spoke with folks who are occupying buildings and say, we're in North Fulton because this is where a lot of our workers work. So we still have 70% of our labor force in Midtown or in downtown, but we realized that if we wanted to keep everybody, we had to have a place for those who just couldn't make the commute to downtown to be able to work locally. Now, this is where all the success that our neighbors have been having can benefit us because there are companies even here in the Deerfield Parkway corridor 
that came here just to be part of the marketplace, not necessarily to be part of Milton. And I will say without sharing any more information on it, when I asked the question, if you had to do it all over again, would you pick Milton over Alfred or Roswell? The response is no. And I said, well, why not? I thought, found that to be an honest but interesting answer. And they said, those other areas are getting better at putting amenities close by to where the workers are. And so if we were to do it all over again today, we would probably pick one of those locations because there would be more stuff for our workers and there'd be more employment satisfaction out of our, out of our company. And so that to me is real time information, once again, from Deerfield Parkway about how the future of this area may need to go. This is just a graphic um, that, we, that we were able to uh, pull off of the, um, the tech clients, right? Yeah, and it's just, just to show you the concentration of the types of jobs. It's just a graphic to kind of give you a sense of where all these companies are, and obviously coming up 400 and into North Fulton County is a big deal. And the other part to that, and I'll, I'll, I apologize for beating the dead horse, is a lot of those jobs are young folks. A lot of that industry is folks that are not in their, in their formated family years where they're looking for the house and a short commute to their job. They're looking for that lifestyle that allows them to get out of their cars. Um, so what does all this mean for the Deerfield Parkway study area? Well, integrating the community vision and market reality is going to be paramount for success. I've already mentioned this a number of times. The reality is the way it's zoned right now, the restrictions that we put on development out there is part of the reason why we haven't seen the area grow up the way that the max amount of development allows. Um, one of the issues is the TDR program. We talked a little bit about that last time we were together. The reality is, is that by trying to get even to the maximum, which still doesn't get you that full mixture of uses on the site, it's extremely expensive. And we were doing some back-of-the-envelope calculations. It almost doubles the cost of the land to get to that full maximum build-out potential. And so if I have to pay a dollar for the land, then I have to pay a whole other dollar just to be able to do the development. It's, it's effectively pricing me out of the marketplace. And so that's one of the considerations. So your zoning restrictions have likely curtailed the competitiveness for this particularly new development. Um, speculative office is highly unlikely, coming as tenants are identified. What that means for Deerfield Parkway is, even though we may identify a mixture of uses to be developed, office may be the last thing that's put into the ground because the investors are not going to put those buildings up until they know they have a tenant in hand. And so while stuff like residential and support retail to go along with that residential may come out of the ground because demand is so strong even today, the reality is the office may be the last piece that comes out unless there's a tenant already in hand to, to fill that space. Um, residential will be a requirement as any part of any development. Uh, we talk about that already, but just to reiterate real quick, it meets the needs for the workforce, the, not just the folks that are in the million dollar house price point, but the entire spectrum of affordability for, for folks that are working. It mitigates the development cost of the less productive commercial space. The reality, whether we like it or not, is rents here don't justify the cost of acquisition, the cost of entitlement, and the cost of development, particularly for office development. I can't make enough money in the rent I can charge under the zoning code for what it's going to take for me to get into the ground. And so the residential effectively subsidizes those costs. Um, I make more on that side. In exchange, I'll give you this other piece that you want. Um, and it's possible modest reduction in car trips. You know, I, I like to tell people a story where I live in Arlington, Virginia. The, there's, a, there's a road called um, uh, Woodrow Wilson Boulevard. And it connects Braslin and Boston, which is along the orange line of the metro. And they intensified development there from about 0.75 FAR up to 10 FAR. I mean, I mean, we're talking skyscrapers and tall buildings. They actually saw a reduction in the number of cars on Wilson Boulevard after the development was over because people didn't need to get in their cars to go eat, to go to work, to go, to, go back home. And so the, it, it was a true proven impact that when you put jobs and housing together and you give people options where they don't have to live that far away, you can actually mitigate some of the transportation impacts. That I always like to say is we're never going to solve the problem of North Fulton County's traffic problem. There's just not enough capacity from a road perspective to ever accommodate the demand that we even have now, let alone the demand we're going to have in the future as more and more development occurs in Forsyth County, Cobb County, Gwinnett County. Um, I was, had this conversation with some folks in Roswell on Friday. I said, there are two east-west connectors through all of North Fulton County, Holcomb Bridge Road and 120. And the reality is there's a ton of people living in, in East Cobb, and there's a ton of jobs in 400 Corridor and Gwinnett County. And we're never going to solve for the fact that people are going to be 
they're going to be building more houses over there and we're going to be getting more jobs over here, but we can provide options for folks that they don't have to go over there and we can try and reduce that impact overall. The current zoning allows for transitional development pattern, which is great, but it doesn't go far enough from our perspective. The reality is, is that we see the retail along nine as the transitional buffer between the Deerfield Parkway corridor, our study area, and the rest of the city. And we, we would encourage the city to think that way as well, is allowing that dense of development, that type of development in the entire 300 acre study area, and then let that, that retail buffer. And if you're standing in front of Walmart, uh, or Target, excuse me, if you're standing in front of Target and you're looking at a 25 foot tall building, you're probably the tallest person on the council, right? You about 6'3", maybe? Am I, am I close? No, I'm not. But okay. Well, let's say you were 6'3". <laughs> At 25 feet, you can't see over the top of the building. And so the reality is that allowing that intensity of development, not necessarily 16 stories like you have up along 400, but, you know, 6, 8, 10, 12 stories up to behind that retail is still not going to be a visual cue from the other side and you have created a buffer and then you've created incentive for the type of development that we believe that we heard you say you really wanted for this corridor. Um, the infill development is as important as new and I talked a lot about this. Uh, it provides existing property owners the opportunity to remain competitive. Uh, it will create some consistency in development scale and features so you're not going to have this standalone suburban office building and then this really dynamic piece right next to it, but really no way to connect to it. So the idea is here is as you, because we have multiple property owners, if we look at it as a holistic unit, how can we create those pedestrian, those bicycle, those non-motorized ways to connect in between those properties rather than having to dump back out on a Deerfield Parkway and, have, and then go back into it? You know, what we've done with our residential development, whether we like it or not, one way in, one way out subdivisions, it dumps you all onto the same road, then you go and then you all get back off the same road. For a dynamic live, work, play environment, you want to be able to move in between those properties without having to get back onto the main roads. And so by that infill development strategy allows you to, to accomplish that. Um, and then finally, coordination and collaboration with your property owners is going to be critical. Um, we have been diligently reaching out to property owners. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a conversation with the folks from Crescent very, very soon. We continue to reach out to Verizon because they are an important player in this. We have talked to a number of the other property owners already in the corridor, but the reality is we are collecting feedback from them just like we're collecting feedback from you because even if the city wants it, if they don't, then it's a plan that's going to look great but really not have any accomplishments. So in even beyond my time here, when we're done with this, that continued engagement, communication, collaboration, which I would say is probably the more important word, is going to be necessary to see the entire area transform and the entire area meet the potential that it has. So that's what I have for you for today. Like I said, I, 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 there's a substantial amount of data that goes behind this that we'll be happy to share with you if you'd like, but you know, this is really, the, from our perspective, the, the Cliff Notes version. Uh, yes, sir. So do you think we have room for destination amenities? Yes. In your area? Okay. Absolutely. Well, sure. you already have one destination amenity that's not being used in that, in that water feature. That lake is inaccessible, right. but it's, it's a tremendous amenity that with a proper amount of development around it, which is why we talk about things like partnerships with Verizon, mm -hmm. could be something that would be a unique amenity that could draw people not just from Milton, but from lots of places. But yes, I do believe you have opportunities for other types of destination venues. You have some very large parcels over there that are mm -hmm. undeveloped. You have some very large parcels that are underdeveloped. And with a proper development strategy, you can integrate those destination amenities into that development program. So yes, I believe you do. Cool. It's not going to be a um, competitive sports complex with right. eight box fields and nine diamonds. But we're talking more appropriately scaled and type of development that fits in with a mixed use live work play environment. So I, I do have a, since, since you are stunned to silence, and I apologize about that, <laughs> um, I do have um, a couple of things that, and not necessarily for a response today, but things I would like to leave you for thought that we can talk about in the future. One of them is what are the tipping point metrics for you? We've talked about this when we kicked the project off. There's going to be the fiscal side of things. There is the job creation side of things. There's the destination amenities. When we start talking about options, some of them are going to bring more of those than others. And so what I bring to you is 
which one of those, if you had to trade one for the other, which is the one that you would trade for the other? Like I said, it's not necessary for conversation today, but this is important stuff that we need you to be considering as we move forward through this process. Yeah, quick question, and maybe a question for Sarah, but what is this going to lead to? Because I mean, what's the ultimate goal of this? Money on. Um, so we engaged RKG because we know that Deerfield is this amazing asset that Milton has, but nobody had done an economic development study on it. So while we can sit here and I hate when economic developers say, well, I believe that, well, do you believe it or is it true? Because those are two very different things. So we brought RKG to tell us what we need down there. Is it healthcare IT we need to focus on? Because I would assume it's telecommunications and healthcare IT. They're going to tell us the industries we need to focus on and what the best use of that land is for the future of Milton. Got it. And the best use is job creation, destination creation, and also fiscal benefit. Under our current zoning, correct? Is that what no. We, we are going to look at as if we can create a whole new strategy. So when was the form-based code done? What was that? That's kind of recent, right? 2014, yeah. All right. Oh, man, I'm good. <laughs> well, and... I mean, and, I mean, that was pretty recent, so I was curious what... Has transpired. That's all. Was it the Avalon just kind of changed the game on everything, and we need to keep up, or I don't know. Well, Avalon has changed the game in terms of what the market is going to bear. I would say that, from in, in all candor, um, the the way that your form based code was written made it financially less competitive than other areas, not just in North Fulton County, but in this region, to attract investors. When, when you, like I mentioned earlier, when you double the cost of the land through the entitlement process where I have to buy all the TDRs to be able to get that scale of development, it makes it, it makes it less of an attractive investment for me. And so if you're asking me why haven't you seen anything since 2014, I would argue just off the top of, my, off the, top of the list is it's, it's very costly to be able to do the same kind of development that other communities aren't just allowing, but they're incenting and becoming investment partners on. Matt? So we have form-based code here on Crab Apple. We also have the same similarly written in Deerfield. Um, it's working here. Is it just not spilled over there, or is it just – what exactly is the difference? Uh, scale, the, the ownership patterns. Um, when, if I have owned the land for long periods of time and I don't have a lot of debt on it, then the land can Nothing. become the tool I use to subsidize the cost of some of the things I have to do, right. as opposed to I purchase the land at market price. Right. And as a result, now there's all these additional costs that I either wasn't anticipating or I can't bury in the inherent value of the land that I own. Mm -hmm. And so those, those are two components. But I would say, and like I mentioned, scale is also another one. We're talking completely different types of developments. It has similar looks, but, I mean, these are two and three stories, separated uses. Um, which is a lot different than what we're talking about we want to see over there and that investors are going to want to get into. Okay. So, and then the other question is, it, once again, for thought, is not necessarily for answer, is this our last best opportunity for balance? And when I say balance, the balance between residential, non-residential development, the balance between the, the revenue that we're, the fiscal impacts that we're going to get and the type of development that will, will need to happen to make that happen. Uh, and then amenities and then job creation. Once again, going back to whether we like it or not, this is the, the one piece where we can really have a substantial impact on the non-residential component of this community, uh, barring any major rezonings elsewhere, which, which A, is out of my purview, and B, I, I would never say that out loud in this community. So um, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, is this our last best opportunity? And hopefully as we go through the rest of this process, you keep those thoughts in mind as well. You know, I just and I, I just want to make a comment, and, and 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 again, no disrespect to any of this or whatever in the process. It's just you know we have to keep in mind Milton is a is a is a different animal, and obviously you know as, as you stated, we've got a, about two percent of undeveloped um, non-residential land, which obviously um, not only for for job growth for our, our citizens and and a tax base um, for our city, that's good. But we also have to be careful um, trying to be all things to, to, to everybody. And, and when I say that, you know, a lot of these um, communities that have developed like this, then it kind of just spreads out and it kind of blends in. But, 
Milton, if you look around, you know, 85% is, is residential and, and agriculturally zoned um, and very low density. So, you know, sometimes we have to kind of look at that as, hey, we're a, a diamond in the rough here. You know, if you need some higher density housing or whatever, you can drive to Alpharetta or Forsyth County or this or that. So I guess my only point to that is I, I, I do see this area as our, our, our crown jewel, so to speak, that we need to do something with. But we also need to be careful that we don't, it's not a catalyst to, to become anywhere USA, everywhere else, because, uh, you know, Milton is a little different. So whatever that's worth, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's the whole point of the reason why we're doing this conversation now rather than, hey, here's your options, is because I'm trying to spur those, those internal conversations, those internal thoughts, because at the end you are going to have to decide, well, if we go this route, it may mean wonderful fiscal impacts but it may not necessarily be what we envision for our community. Whereas if we go this, this direction, maybe it, it, it fits that, that, that vision that we had, but we're doing it understanding that we're leaving behind the potential for these kind of, those fiscal revenues that can pay for some of the services that we would like to have. There's no right or wrong answer. And I definitely don't advocate for any direction. My job is to provide you the information. I'm just trying to spur those discussions and thoughts so that when we get to the end of this, and we say it, and you say, yep, this is what we want. Everybody's on the same page and understands the ramifications of the choices that they make. Sure. Go. Yeah, so, and this might have been said already, and so I apologize if I'm repeating the question, but is part of the delivery going to be what difference does it make to Milton if we were to take one track versus another? In other words, if we left things, well, let me back up a little bit. When I first joined the council, one of the things that I thought I understood was that you have to strike a good balance between your residential community and your commercial community in a city in order to drive the tax revenue to a point where you're sustainable. Because it's pretty common knowledge, residential taxpayers get more services than they pay for. Commercial taxpayers get less services than they pay for. The taxes to the commercial side fund or uh, subsidize some of the stuff going on with the residential yes. piece of this. So I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, we really got to be careful because Milton did not have a lot of commercial property. We, we were, and, you know, it wasn't by design. It was by what was left over when Milton got became a city. Mm -hmm. But we've been going for... 12 years now, 13, 13 years, whatever it is. And this doesn't seem to be a real problem for us. We seem to have struck whatever balance we needed to to make the equation work. We're not, you know, growing, you know, hand over fist. We're making our budget. In fact, we get, you know, high marks on a regular basis for managing our finances. Mm -hmm. We're able to go out and buy green space when we need to fund bonds, build parks, do those things that we need to. So we've figured out a way of getting this done. So the question that citizens are going to ask us is, Joe, why do we need to change anything? To Joe's point, what, what is the benefit for the city? What's the benefit for me as a resident? Because to tell you the truth, I sort of like the way things are working right now. Well, and, and I think those are all legitimate questions to be asked. I mean, my response to that is, um, going back to your first point, in general, yes, resident does consume residential does consume more services than it pays for. But there is a break-even point where the value of the residential unit, based on the services they consume, can tip. And so, uh, I'll give you, for instance, we just did a fiscal impact study in Framingham, Massachusetts, which is the exurb of the city of Boston, and we learned that when we did our analysis, that a housing unit worth about four hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars generally paid as much in revenue to the city as it consumed in services that it grabbed. Now, that's based on the average number of kids per housing unit, blah, 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 blah. So it's always going to be variable. But across the city as a whole, you generally, at that price point, you were going to effectively break even over a large enough sample size. Well, what was going on in Framingham, all their new construction, single-family residential, was seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000. And so when you're building that to that value, 
even though it's residential, you are going to generally create more revenue to the community than those housing units are going to consume in services. So in general, yes, residential does consume more, but there is a point where you hit that luxury marketplace where they provide more revenue than they consume in terms of services. So that leads then to your next question is, well, then why do I need to change anything? And that's the reason why we're not just looking at it from a fiscal perspective. We're looking at it from an employment perspective. We're looking at it from a sustainability of the area, trying to make those properties competitive so they don't go down and become blighted. We're trying to create some of the amenities that we had heard people said they would like to have in Milton rather than to have to travel somewhere else to get them. Now, what comes out of the back end of it may not be compelling enough to allow the type of development that it would take to make those things happen. And that's okay. That's the purpose of this study is to determine what can happen there, what are we going to get out of it, dollar-wise, amenity-wise, job creation-wise, and is it something that we want in our community? And all of those things need to be weighed against each other as you as the council will make a decision on whether or not how we're going to pursue this. Once again, if you feel like we're, we're trying to advocate for a strategy, that is not what I am here for. I'm here to provide you options, help you understand the trade-offs you're making so that you can make an informed decision. No, no, that's what I understood. I just wanted to make sure there was a benefit, you know, analysis done. Yes. Matt? Um, you know, one thing we haven't talked about, and I think one of the things that helped Milton overcome the ratio of the commercial versus residential in the last several years really was our negotiations with the local option sales tax with Fulton County. Um, we benefited from that because when the, when the first census was done, we were thought to have, what, 16,000 residents here, and then when the census was done, it turned out we had 32 at the time. Um, that gave us a windfall that allowed us to um, get more revenue in for the city. So that jumped our budget up from 20 million to what, about 24 and a half, 25, something like that. Um, there's no guarantee that that ratio is gonna maintain as we go through negotiations that's come up in about two years. Um, we need to start preparing for that now, um, Sarah. <laughs> so, you know, as far as that goes, how that process works, how much we should anticipate getting with that because of that for whatever reason, you know, if it flattens out, that still puts additional pressure on our residents. We still need to have a commercial base. The question becomes, though, if it goes down at all, then we're in trouble. And, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, and we obviously had a lot of pressure on our residents with an increase in taxes this past year also. So, um, I, think, I think we got a pass for the last several years, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be having that going forward. Well, and in all fairness, um, back in 2010, we were hired by the city of Roswell to do their first ever economic development plan. And the reason why Roswell decided to do their first ever economic development plan is they went from being the it North Fulton location right. to one of the smallest and least competitive locations within North Fulton County. And they saw their commercial occupancy drop to a high teens percentage. They couldn't fill their retail spaces and they were showing that it wasn't that they couldn't generate the revenue that they wanted to operate, but they realized that they were going to have to go back and keep hitting on the citizens to be able to do that. And so they said, hey, we got we to gotta reverse this trend. we got to figure this out. We need to start bringing some of that investment. At the time, Alfredo was just eating their lunch on everything. And they said, we got to reverse this trend. And so I only bring that up to say is maybe we are good for the last 10 or 15 years, and maybe we will be good for the next 15 to 20 years. But the economy and supply and demand is a fickle partner is that what why we may be in the cat seat now it may move 20 miles north up 400 into the middle of Forsyth County and then we're going to be you're going to hire my son hopefully or grandkid <laughs> maybe grandkid but let's be more optimistic I'll live a little longer to to um to come and say hey our our commercial occupancy has dropped down into the you know high teens low 20 percent and we we can't keep hitting our citizens up with tax increases every year. We've got to figure out what to do. I always advise my clients is you absolutely need to do what's in the best interest of your community, but you have to look at this as a long-term sustainability thing and not just, uh, well, we're good today, so let's rest on our laurels. I think that's another thing. You know, one of the benefits of being a municipality is while you're relatively young, in theory, you're going to be here for a long, long time. So decisions should be made thinking well out into the future, not just not just into the into the short term. No, and I would say you've, you've done a good job too, relating that that you know again all these points are well taken and we are in a, a good position, but you know not uh, pointing for one direction, but 
you know, get us given options to think about through. Absolutely. Laura? So, and we are in that sweet spot with, you know, 465. That, that's what makes us so unique. And, and that's why I think we're okay with low density, but I wouldn't want to um, jeopardize future taxpayers. So I would also like to see, as Council Member Longoria mentioned, you know, the cost benefit analysis for future taxpayers. And then also other unique cities, I know you've mentioned Roswell, but we are in that 465 sweet spot. So if there's other um, cities across the nation that have contemplated this decision, I would like to see, um, you know, those, you know, that and how it was rezoned and what it looked like. Sure. We can find some, we can find some examples of other communities that have, I mean, you know, and I know you know this, that not every, all communities are different and unique in their own situation, but we can find some communities that maybe have similar characteristics that have made this type of investment for you to consider. I, I'm just thinking right now where I live in the city of Alexandria. Um, it's a, we're right on the outside of D.C., so we're not this far north, but there's a whole area of the city that is away from where most of the residential development exists, where they have made it into, it's, it's, it's called the Eisenhower Valley. They have made it into high-rise office development and it looks completely different than the rest of the city of Alexandria. But it was done because, A, it was further away from the, res the, the established residential neighborhoods, and they use it to create jobs and tax base that could help pay for some of the services that they wanted for their citizens. So I'm sure I could find, and that's just my own personal lifestyle example, I'm sure I could find others where they have done similar types of strategies so that you can have something to consider as you go through this process. I'm happy to take a look and find a few for you. Okay. Anybody else, Rick? Yeah, as part of what you're doing, are you going to do the cost analysis as far as the services, taking a look at what our cost is today for the residential, looking at sustainability, where we're going to go with that? And then I guess looking at a regional standpoint, we are seeing different development as far as commercial. It's, it's pretty exciting to see some of the stuff that's happening outside of Milton to say how can we in this final piece what makes sense to fit there where we can actually leverage it. And I think that's one of the things I'd like to see. I think we all have said we want to see that come out of this is give us options, give us thought. What, when you talk about zoning restrictions, specifically what do you think we'd have to change so we can consider, well, no, we don't want to do that, or what are the impacts? If we do that, what does that mean? And I know a lot of what we hear is from attraction is having affordable housing. Well, we've already got a lot of density of, of high density housing right in that area. So uh, that's one thing we've tried to really balance as far as what we do, because there are impacts. The more you put in info, there's impacts even to schools and other services. So you have to look at, well, that may sound great, but what does that do long term for your community? Yes. So I, get, I guess what I'm asking is, is that going to be part of that so we understand here's what today you're paying per resident for services for residential, what does it break out to? Because when we're looking at sustainability, that's where I'd want to see the financials to say what makes sense. And then when you give us the recommendation or options, how does that feed into it? Yes, the way we do it, so to directly answer your question, yes, we're going to be looking at the breakout of what does it cost from it. We use what's called an incremental approach. And so what that means is we say, okay, here's all the costs we spend on everything for the city. We take out intergovernmental transfers, stuff that comes from the state and the feds, because that comes in and goes back out, so it has no impact. And then we look at, well, what are fixed costs? Uh, Steve, you're not going to hire a second city manager if you build more development in the city. So that's a fixed cost that stays with the city no matter what you do. So we pull all those fixed costs, and that leaves us with what are the costs that we incur that are related to investment, related to new development whether it's new residential or new commercial. And then we use that to say, okay, on average, for every new citizen we bring in, this is our cost. For every new, bit, we usually do it on a per thousand dollar value of non-residential development because that allows us to balance for industrial office and retail, which have different values per square foot, but they also have different consumption of services. And so we use that and say, okay, if we go with this development program, these are the net new incremental revenues and these are the net new incremental costs. And you can look at them against each other. Well, here's development strategy B, which maybe is less intense or more focused on this instead of that. And here's what that looks like. And then here's almost like a existing zoning or, a, or what we like to call do-nothing strategy where we leave it as is. 
what does that look like? And so then you'll have these different things to look at to say, well, this one creates a positive impact of $10. This one creates a positive impact of $5. This one creates a positive impact of $2. But each one has a different mix of uses and means a different thing for our community. And so then you as a group will then say, I'm okay with just $2 because I don't want what the $10 brings to us. If does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I'm being overly simplistic, but yet, hopefully it's, it's clear. No, it makes sense. And I just know <laughs> my in-laws are from the, the DC area. So I saw over the last 30 some years down by Crystal City and some of the changes where they built up, they did almost like an Avalon. When you get off the, the Beltway, Austin, it's like you're in a community. There's Whole Foods, there's, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of employment, and you still can get around. So that, I like that you're looking at other parts as well as regionally. What can we do and how do we attract that? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you very we'll much. see you, I guess, soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any public comment on that? We do not. All right, Sudi, if you'll please call the next one, and if we have any public comment on that, let me know. And we don't have any public comment on number two. Discussion of gravel road maintenance, Ms. Sarah Leaders. Oh, we might have a public comment. Yeah, I think, okay, We've got a public comment. If, uh, if you're okay, Sarah, I'll allow the public comment first. That way, you maybe it'll address that. Sudi, so if you please. And uh, the speaker is Luz Feliz Car Carcalamon. Uh, Luz Feliz Car Carcalamon. Thank you. Um, if I could just make a quick... If you don't mind, just for the yes. record, will you please address, uh, state your address, too, just for the record. Of course. Thank you. Um, so my first name is Luz. My last name is Velez Cardamon. The address is 14540 Wood Road, Milton. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could just make a quick observation on the prior presentation, um, it would be probably a, worth, uh, a worthy idea to look at the city of Weston, Florida. It's about 25 miles from Fort Lauderdale. 25 miles from Miami. Um, it's ranked number 21 uh, per Money Magazine versus Milton, which is ranked 24. In terms of geographic size, uh, the city of Milton is about 39 square miles. Weston is about 26 square miles. Uh, they have very much limited the use of uh, commercial and everything they were talking about here. Uh, and it's extremely residentially uh, focused, and only the outer perimeter has um, opportunity for commercial development. Uh, the median household is very similar to Milton, and the home values as well. So, you know, as you continue to observe and discuss your prior uh, agenda item, it'd be a good idea to look at what they've done, because in order to stay competitive with the adjacent city, which is Pembroke Pines, they had to create more lifestyle engaging like activities because of the millennials that were um, going to that area and and surrounding communities to work and without that they were going to be taken out by for example the city of Pembroke Pines that has the similar Avalon you know on a smaller scale but it probably behoove you because there's a lot of similarities between um, the crime level and the um, base of uh, income of and the quality of the homes. I mean, not as many horse properties or anything like that, but definitely um, CEO, uh, you know, and other, you know, C-suite type people. And the reality is that as um, a parent of... Uh, two young men that own their own company and are millennials, one of them a Georgia Tech grad, um, that is the biggest challenge. They have to leave this area in order to be able to get the lifestyle component that, that doesn't exist. And so why just um, give away that income that could be infused into the city that would help further grow the city and increase your tax basis? You know, all these so to speak, well-to-do parents have these millennials that, you know, they don't want to be next to mom and dad, but they want to be probably in the general circumference, potentially. And why waste 
that potential income for the city. So anyway, that's a quick comment. So um, on Wood Road, I'm uh, an owner of Wood Road. I know there's another resident here at least that's an owner on Wood Road. I'm not exactly sure to what depth you're going to be discussing the maintenance of Wood Road. Prior to the meeting, I, I approached three uh, panel members, but um, I would tell you that we are very concerned, uh, not just my family, but other residents of Wood Road as to the maintenance, as to the traffic, as to the parking, um, as to the um, general disregard by some of the people that are using it as if it was a park. Uh, the city of Milton has magnificent parks with all kinds of things. So it's definitely affecting the maintenance, the, the deterioration of the road. And I would also add that I personally called the Department of Transportation or the Department of Education Transportation Department because of the velocity in which the school buses are traveling on Wood Road. I was told by another resident that supposedly when Birmingham Falls was built, the school buses were not supposed to be going through um, Wood Road as a, as a thoroughfare unless there was actually a child that was going to be picked up. And that is definitely adding to the deterioration of Wood Road. Um, and when I called, they said it's a public road. They can go on any road they want, you know, basically shut up in a nutshell. They didn't use the word shut up, but they were very direct in what they were telling me. And I called three times uh, because in the last eight weeks, I've spent a lot of time in the front of my property and seeing the velocity of those school buses, which there's no doubt deteriorates the road. And I'm not a, you know, a traffic engineer or a construction person, but just want to bring that to your attention. Thank you for your time. No, thank you very much yeah. for your comments, Tim. Sure. Do you have any other public comment? That's all, sir. Okay. All right. Okay, Sarah. All right, good evening. Uh, tonight we wanted to talk about uh, the gravel road maintenance activities and schedules we currently have, um, talk about some of the, the challenges and um, to look at some potential, um, potential initiatives. Uh, first of all, gonna look at the inventory, where they're located, uh, talk about the maintenance history, budgeting, expenses, um, look at condition rating, and then, like I said, the challenges and some, some goals for, for the condition of the roads. This map shows all of the gravel roads in that kind of dark brown gold color. Um, about half of the roads are connector roads, so they um, either connect to different roads or, or uh, create access points on the same roadway. Um, six of those we classified as, as like a major connector, and eight would be um, a more minor used connector roadway. The black dots are the intersections that are planned for improvement. Um, some of the connections are used during peak hours when, when intersections experience delay. So by, by those improvements being underway, um, we expect to see some of those volumes go down. Uh, this is classification we set up to, to have a better understanding of, of the use of the roadways. Um, the major connectors, those are the the higher volume gravel roads in the city. Um, those are the ones we hear um, a lot of the issues about for maintenance activities. Minor connectors, those, like I said, also connect either the same road or two different roads, um, but they're not, not as highly used. Minor roads um, are dead-end roadways. Um, again, similar volumes to the minor connectors. And then the driveway classification, while those are public roadways, um, their function is more like a driveway. They serve, serve only a few residents. And like I said, although it's a, a public roadway, um, they, are, they are serving more of the driveway type purpose. Um, and the driveway class roadway, those do require a little less, less uh, maintenance frequency. So while we may hit the others four times a year, the driveway class is uh, one to two times. 
Joe, Joe's going Sarah, first. real yes. quick. Is there a traffic volume uh, differential, do, or can you tell me what the traffic volume differential is between a major connector and a connector, or a minor connector? We have some older traffic counts. We're going to do a map that showed those, but weren't able to get get all of those together. Um, is, when, is there an objective threshold that defines one or the other, or or how did we classify these roads? The I believe we do have counts on all of the major connectors. Those are the only ones that we have have um, done traffic counts on. So the others are low enough volumes that it's just the the parcels on them that are, are generating okay. the trip. Right. So we, we actually have not counted, I don't believe we've counted any of the minor connectors, but the major connectors are enough volume that we, we have done traffic counts on. Okay. There is a differential between the two, um, yeah. depending on the, the number of roads, the amount of volume that, that end up, Freemanville is a major, uh, major connector, Birmingham, uh, Birmingham uh, Hopewell, things like that. Right, major, right. Would be, okay. be obvious major connectors. You have the same thing on the ground. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to look back over the, the last 12 years, what our maintenance has looked like on the gravel roads. Um, we've always approached it by scheduled maintenance activities. Um, in 2007 and 8, we were um, visiting those two times a year. Um, had a started with just a tractor and scrape blade for uh, grading, grading the roads. Originally started as part of a, um, the operations budget. Once I get to the, the budget, you'll see that in 07 and 08, we didn't have any capital expenditures on the gravel roads. It was, it was just a maintenance activity. Um, and then into 08, 09, uh, we brought in a subcontractor to um, assist with the maintenance. Then in 2010, we hired two um, retired Fulton County employees that, that uh, previously graded the gravel roads in this area. So we hired them in 2010. Um, in 2010, we also went to renting all of our own all the equipment used. Uh, in 2012, started at IGA with Roswell for the, the use of the motor grader. Um, and that is tied to one particular piece of equipment. So when that equipment, Roswell no longer uses it. We'll have to reevaluate that that um, IGA. I'll get into the cost of that in just a little bit. Um, started the calcium chloride treatment that's for dust control in 09. Um, 09 bumped up the frequency to three times a year for the, the grading. And then in 18, bumped it up to four times a year. Um, a lot of information on this slide. So... Do you have any questions on it before I move on? Okay. So like I said, in 2007 and 8, the maintenance activities were um, funded through the operations budget. In 2009, took on our first capital projects for gravel roads. Um, we did some drainage improvements, driveway pipes, cross drains, and we did a trial project for stabilizing the surface course of the roadway. Um, after that, most of our spending, funding has been spent on equipment and dust control, and we've had just a few additional uh, minor drainage projects. For 19, that shows the expenditures so far, but looking at um, our last treatment of, of the dust control, uh, we're on track to spend about 160000 this year. So the blue is what was started in the account at the beginning of the fiscal year, and the red is what, what was spent during that year. So there's a, there's a big differential between the... There is. ...versus spent. Yeah. What drove that? We, we did estimates for the, the amount of, of rentals and materials, but... Um, even though we do a scheduled maintenance, um, the weather can create capital, unknown capital needs. So um, wanted to put a contingency in there for any, any drainage issues that could come up. Uh, we also have staff hours, but those are billed under a um, operations account. So that's for the part-time employees. 
This is a list of of what the expenses look like. Um, said we're we're in a uh, renting most of the equipment. Um, the Roswell IGA allows for the motor grader. That's the most expensive piece of equipment to maintain the roadways. Um, the backhoe is used for the the ditch maintenance and dump truck for for the grading and the ditch maintenance. Uh, water truck. The water is actually used in the the grading activities to um, keep the dust down, make the surface more more usable to to grade. Um, then, as far as materials, we have the gravel that we bring in. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Milton specific mix we're using now, and then fuel. And the largest largest cost is the uh, the dust abatement, which is the calcium chloride treatment. When we do that citywide, it's thirty three thousand dollars a treatment. The pavement surface evaluation rating manual um, is set up. There's a gravel road specific pacer manual, and the, it looks at several evaluation criteria for determining a rating, um, crown drainage, the surface defects, the gravel layer, and the dust. Describes the causes and distresses and provides a system to visually rate conditions of the roadways. Um, as part of our pavement evaluation that is is coming up, we actually did include the gravel roads in that as well. So we'll get a a, um, a rating on those in the next couple months as that evaluation takes place. But um, on the right hand side, you can see the five ratings that are part of that Pacer manual. Um, from a one being the the worst, travels difficult, complete rebuilding required to rating five, the condition of a and newly constructed roadway. Also pulled some information. Um, Federal Highway has a document on gravel road maintenance guide. So this shows shows the typical cross section of a of a gravel road with a shoulder ditch and then a, a crown on the roadway as well. Some cases on some of our roads are so narrow that that maintaining that crown can be difficult um, because of the the way the um, cars travel down the roadway. Um, if they're not staying in their lane, they can the crown wears differently than if if they're traveling on either side of the, the high point in the roadway. Is there some good examples of crown and drainage along gravel roads? The image on the left shows um, using the motor grader to to uh, cut in a ditch. Um, some of that material, in our cases, can be can be reclaimed and used back on the roadway. Sometimes, it's, if if there is no gravel in it, it's it's uh, put in a dump truck and hauled away. Um, and then on the right hand side is it's what the motor grader blade looks like, and again, it's it's reclaiming the material where where possible. Some examples of some drainage drainage issues um, on the left is a, a structure that is is at the low point, but there's nowhere for the water to go. So the the pipe underneath that structure actually runs against the grade to get to get to the point where it it daylights and can discharge into the ditch. The image on the right shows a low point that that doesn't have one of those structures, and the water water has nowhere to go. There's a berm built on the um, the edge of the right of way that that just creates a, a holding point for the water. There's some other drainage drainage issues. Um, the top image that was a, a repair that was done about a year ago to to clear a pipe. Um, the bottom left image is that same area back in. April 19th when we had over four inches of rain in a 12-hour period. Um, and then the bottom right is that area fixed again, the ditch cleaned out and the sides stabilized. The top, top right image um, is a result of um, 
what I'll show, I think, on the next slide is called a secondary ditch, where the water just it runs down the, the edge of the edge of the roadway. Um, and then when it gets to the low point, it starts eroding, eroding the roadway. So here's some more photos of what are called secondary ditches. Uh, the top right was during a rain event. You can see the, where the water's channelizing um, within the roadway. And the bottom one is, is showing kind of that shoulder area. It's not, not visible that it, it doesn't have a low point, but it's creating, it's serving almost like a, a curb and keeping the water along the roadway. Um, the top left shows the red line is, is what the contour looks like, so it does, it does um, form somewhat like a curb. Uh, the black line is if, if you were to go in and, and scrape that edge to, to allow the water to flow into the ditch. And that would look like, let me go back to like this image to, to cut in the ditch. At several places where um, where we have drainage across driveways that that create washout in the roadway and along the the edges, um, sometimes the paved driveways are are pitched so that the water cannot can, doesn't get into the ditch but but runs across the road. Sometimes it runs along the edge of the driveways. Um, and the middle one shows yeah running running across the road creating washout. Some examples of where in the in the surface, and these are these are usually addressed with the the regrading. Um, it, they cut out the potholes, um, compact it back, and and create recreate the crown of the roadway. Just before our April grading of the roadways, uh, we started utilizing a new uh, gravel mixture material. Um, it's it contains more of the the larger larger rocks and less of the fines. Um, and the image on the right is, is what's called a sieve analysis, where it it catches the different materials as they as they go through the smaller openings. Um, so the new mix, um, as the chart shows, on the uh, about on the half inch size starts starts to be significantly less of those smaller materials. Um, and we're going to continue to to evaluate that material, but so far it seems to seems to be working well. Some of the dust control um, products, like I talked about, the the water truck in the in the maintenance grading is needed to to keep the material workable and keep the dust down. And then on the right is what a calcium chloride dust abatement treatment looks like. I want to show an example of um, one of our problem areas, Lively Road. I think we've had to close it twice this year uh, for for flooding. Um, the water does have a, a pipe that runs under the roadway, but when the water reaches a certain level, it it um, creates a, a runaround um, and washes out the roadway. So that would be an example of one of the future capital projects we could we could look at on these roadways. We've been just addressing it with an additional equipment rental and getting our um, part-time crews to come by and, and get it back in, get the gravel scooped back and get the road back in operation. So this slide has a lot of information, but I was trying to relate what we currently do um, and where, where we feel like that falls in that rating scale and what higher ratings, what kind of um, activities those would, those would need to achieve those higher ratings on the roadways. Um, to start with, I feel like most of our roadways are, are rating three, um, which equates to our, our four times a year uh, grading frequency. Um, all the equipment we currently, currently rent, and it's done through a, a program, so program rentals. Our staffing right now is is two part-times dedicated solely to the gravel road maintenance. Just addressed the potholes 
with, with the grading. Um, ditches are cleaned out one to two times a year. Um, the drainage and driveways, all we're doing right now with those is, is some limited debris removal just to keep those functioning, and then we're, we haven't addressed any, any large driveway projects. Sir, real quick, um, mm -hmm. you have a rating here that's separate from the minor listing that you had as well. So right, this do, goes. Do these overlap? Do they coincide directly, or it they just don't. depends on the road? Okay, just yeah. curious. Yeah, these go back to, to more condition versus uh, volumes. Gotcha. Didn't, didn't tie those together at okay. all. But, um, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. The, the only relation of those classifications is that the, the very small roads do require less of the, the grading maintenance. Um, so then as we look into a, a rating four um, to get that, we feel like it would need to be more weather-based grading frequency. Um, so like we could add, add an additional piece of equipment, a skid steer, to help with, with some of that pothole work. Um, likely need to purchase some of the equipment to have better availability. Sometimes um, getting, getting that equipment is, sometimes the rental companies don't always have, have it on hand when we need it. So like we would need um, an additional staff to, to help manage that program as well as inspect the work when it's done. Potholes, we'd have a, a more frequent response to those. Ditch cleaning would be every time we grade and we would look at, at some possible driveway driveway um, addressing some of those severe grades and, and washouts. Sarah, excuse me. So today in, in Milton, are we maintaining like rating two or three? Is that what you're saying we're right. able to do with current staff and current funding? Correct. That's the level of maintenance on the major and minor that we're, we're able to do? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then when we get to a, a level five, um, that would that would take after each rain event going out and looking at the roads, um, possibly some some pipe cleaning with a, a jet vac and some additional ditch maintenance, um, likely a purchase of purchase of most of the equipment, full time, part time, and then once we have equipment, we get into the fleet management, um, storing those, keeping them maintained, having a someone that knows mechanics of the of the equipment. Uh, potholes would, could be an immediate response at that point. Um, again, ditch cleaning with every grading would address all major impacts to the roadway system and possibly look at some other options for dust control. Sarah, can I break in before you change this slide? Sure. So like Sarah said, there's a lot of information on the slide, but it's, it's very likely the most important slide in front of you. Um, because what this presentation is about is to try to gauge from council where on the ratings you want us to be um, uh, from time to time the, uh, the maintenance of gravel roads has come up and um, and it's it's hard for us to be able to 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 say okay to get from point a to point B this is what we'll need so what I have, have asked Sarah and her staff to do is to be able to determine okay we're currently we believe at a level three we're going to get that confirmed i believe um through through our current analysis but generally we believe we'll be at a level three if a level three is sufficient then we're putting in the appropriate amount of resources if the city wants to bring this up to a level four to be able to maintain that crown and maintain maintaining the crown has ripple effects it has better drainage if you maintain the crown it will it will drain off from the center correctly you're less likely to have the washboarding and the potholes as long as the, the, under, the foundation underneath is right and you're using the right aggregate. We just changed the aggregate because we felt that that might have been one of the contributing causes. Um, some of the other issues we have, if you, if you can maintain that crown with the four, you may have to put in less money long term to be able to, to maintain the road. But the reality is, is to maintain that level four or, or level five, if that's where you were going, it's going to require more equipment and, and human resources. Uh, we just did, we took a, a road trip two weeks ago and checked out all the, uh, a bunch of the drain, uh, the drainage ditches and things like that. And the picture you saw a little further back of that beautifully done, the schematic of, a, of the going down at a, I think it's a, a, supposed to be at a three to one um, slope, and then the leveled off bottom, that almost doesn't exist here in the city of Milton. Um, our gravel roads are generally too thin. Um, which, is, which causes these vehicles to drive over the crown um, and compress the crown very quickly. 
you, you lose the, the crown very quickly as a result. Um, the starting and stopping of the traffic on gravel roads, you, you, you have transcontinental gravel roads up in Canada with heavy trucks that travel on them. But the reality is, is they just travel on them. It's not, it's not starting and stopping. It's not uh, making turns coming out of a driveway. You don't have the sloped driveways emptying out onto these roads. They just drain on them. Everybody stays on their side of the road, and things are, are a little bit easier to maintain. It's not the same type of, of conditions we have here. That doesn't mean we can't try to maintain a level four. We will just need different resources. We won't, we were gonna have to, we would have to stop renting the equipment. We'd probably have to have it on hand for them to go out. Um, if we want potholes done quick, more quickly, we have to have the resources, the people ready to go out and do it. Probably not a part-time person that is going to have to get a motor grader from Roswell um, because they may be using it. It's, uh, it, that's the purpose of this presentation. We're preparing for the 2020 budget, and we just want to kind of gauge where your thought process is in it. Joe? Yeah, so do we have price tags associated yeah, with it? If we're at rating three now, so we know our current budget sustains rating three, I, I would be inclined to say, well, we ought to give our citizens the best we can, but if it's an order of magnitude difference between where we are or where we would be if we tried to go to a rating four, obviously we need to make some decisions there. Understood. And we have general numbers, which are not included in this presentation. You know, we, we could pick up a, uh, a used motor grader uh, probably at around $95,000 if we wanted to pick up a, a used one. They're much more expensive, brand new. Um, what's, what's truly more expensive is the human resource. If we were going to bring in the, the full-time uh, resource to be able to make sure we're hit, we to hit these gravel roads every day, um, you know, that's going to be X amount plus benefits and, and the cost that, that continues every year. So at one point in time, when we talked about the difference between regular roads and gravel roads, we were told or we analyzed, we figured out that the cost, the annual cost to maintain a gravel road was actually less than that to maintain a normal road, a, a paved road. Now, if, if that's not true anymore, we need to understand that because are we doing the right thing by leaving some of these roads in their current state? So generally, nobody, generally, unless you're keeping it for aesthetics, nobody chooses to keep a gravel road. Um, you, you have gravel roads if you can't afford to, to, to pave the roads or just for whatever reason doesn't make sense. Um, I'd love to see the, 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 the analysis of that. I've never heard of a, of a gravel road cost, costing less to maintain than a, than a paved road, except if you end up in that situation, like I'm talking about maybe some transcontinental road across, the, across Canada, um, where you don't have to maintain it very often and you just have the trucks traveling across it. I, don't know that that I don't believe that to be the case. Yeah, I think our gravel roads are the most expensive roads to mm -hmm. to maintain. I, I would say, you know, certainly um, while the the gravel roads are a minority as far as actual roads uh, number of miles in Milton, uh, I would certainly be. Um, I have uh, witnessed and we hear a lot about them and and from our citizens. So I certainly would would be uh, interested in looking at upgrading um, at least to a four, but again, we've got to have those numbers um, and, and take a look at it to see what it's worth. So, Rick? I guess I'd, I'd go along with that too when Joe and then the mayor asked if we could actually quantify it, what we think the cost is. I mean, these are general figures, but then give us a hard dollar. Like today, here's what our annual budget is to do the, to, to handle the washouts, the excessive rain that we've had, what's it gonna be to get to a, a rating four? The other thing is um, where I, I grew up in Michigan and we had a lot of gravel roads too, and usually we didn't pave them because of cost. They weren't well traveled. In Milton, I think the desire of at least what I've heard, people who live on those, is, it, it's because of the character of the road, so it wouldn't be we're not, we're not keeping them gravel roads because that's more efficient from a cost standpoint to the city, but that is part of the charm and part of what, what is gone. What is Milton compared to other surrounding cities that don't have gravel roads? 
but, but I'd be interested to actually see the, the cost. What's it going to take to actually get it to the next level? Okay. Joe? Then, then somebody needs to justify how we can have a road that is called a major connector that remains a gravel road. If a gravel road is one more expensive to maintain than a, than a paved road, it can't be safer than a paved road. If, if the definition of a major connector, connector implies a level of traffic that we need to be conscious of, because too many bad things can happen, and I don't know what our liability situation is in terms of not maintaining or not providing a road at a level that can manage the traffic that travels on that road if we have an option. We need to figure that kind of stuff out. We need to understand what we're really up against here. Well, that's should be that's Sarah's expertise. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm confident that we'll we'll be able to get solid answers on those as far as quantifying the cost Traffic. per rating. I, I'm fairly confident we're going to be able to get fairly reasonable and reliable figures for that as well. And, and Trip, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree. I, was, I think on the rating four, if we can get to that level, that'd be great. But we do need to have that information as well. Um, obviously, we have a, a desire to maintain the character of our gravel roads as a special part of our city that we've had as far as what we are. So I think every effort we can make towards that end is, is good. But I think Joe makes a good point. We need to make sure we understand the safety perspectives and, and all of that as well, just so we know exactly what we're dealing with and, and any other ingenuity that is out there that can help maintain that aspect of it. So I would say, you know, perfect world. I'd love to see them all five. But again, there's a cost, you know, and a, and a cost to our citizens too. So, right. um, but I think is is the council generally on board to yes. look at upgrading and see what that would do to us? Okay. Yeah, Rick. Cost. And I guess one one question <clears throat> as part of your analysis: Are we actually going to get volumes? So we understand really the the car count, like how often? What is the traffic? What type of traffic do we have going down those roads? We have so we them. Understand. Um, some of yeah. them are a little bit older than others, but, but, but we have them. We regularly go out and, and get the counters out there. Some of them are, are approaching that 400 plus or even are in trips. the 400s now um, trip, which is kind of where you hit that point where, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a lot, even if they're not crushing the crown or they're not truck stop it, stopping and starting. Um, it starts to be excessive wear and tear just from the number of trips. But one thing that Sarah said that, that's very important regarding the number of trips that she said earlier is some of the improvements that are on the horizon, the Birmingham Crossroads, Freemanville and Birmingham, when those are done, the, the attractiveness of those as cut-throughs are going to, to wane, and you're, pro you're likely going to see a significant drop in the volume on, on Nick's and um and and wood oh, okay matt um so i don't know if this is your last slide or not but obviously when we have a lot of people driving on the gravel roads um speed limits are a question as well and and place making signs i don't know if we're going to talk about that later but is there any idea about whether or not we can lower those speed limits just to help reduce impact we didn't wrap this into that presentation this okay. presentation but um you know the police chief has had some some evaluation he's he's been looking at for for enforcement as well as posting do you have anything else to do? i can give you some information on that so uh, the uh police chief was tasked with investigating whether or not we can look at alternative methods to be able to uh deal with the speeds associated with gravel roads because of the inability to be able to enforce the 15 mile an hour speed limit um and oddly enough from our meeting uh, i was very intrigued by the no dust zone which we equated to like a no gravel uh, a no wake zone like right. you would in a boat um, and the chief has been tasked with seeing if that would be something that um, would hold up in court. Um, we're, we may be the first, um, and we may be a test, but um, there may be the possibility that we can control the lower speeds with, uh, with that no dust, because that's really the, the true impact. It's the dust that gets kicked up there. If you leave a, a cloud of dust behind you, like a big wake behind a boat, mm -hmm. maybe an opportunity for us to be able to control the speed de facto through the dust amount that, that ends up in the air. So that's one of the areas we're looking at. The other area is one of the things we've done, as you know, we've created the truck routes, trying to keep the trucks off there. The more trucks we can keep off of those gravel roads, the less impact they're going to have um, if they're not supposed to be on there. We now have that tool in our in our arsenal to be able to do it. Obviously, adding the no trucks uh, on those the signage will help. Right. Um, but there's a whole host of things we're trying to attack this from a bunch of different angles to be able to reduce the wear and tear, safety and quality of life of the people that live on on our gravel roads. 
I have and, a question. You may go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, the other question I was going to have too is place making signs of some kind that also attributes to the attractiveness of the roads. We mentioned that in the individual homes, but also that the city can provide too that just adds to that ambiance. Um, just another thought also. I think there's a lot of things that we could do. You know, some of the things we've also discussed in, with the council, you know, is trying to steer away from some of the, these metallic guardrails and even getting into some of the painted guardrails as just a first step, but it makes a huge difference. Um, Alpharetta's done quite a bit of that, and you see where they've turned the, the metallic, chrome metallic almost, into a, uh, into, into a nice brown. It looks like a it wood. It's not, but there's a lot of other options that we could do, and I think that, that could help on the gravel roads as well. Thank you. I have a question. You may may or may not have, have the answers, but uh, it was brought up before about school bus travel travel on our, our gravel roads. Do we have any control of that, or is there? You know, I hadn't heard that before. As far as the school board, I don't know if you know anything about that, Sarah. I just heard as well that they typically only use the roads if it was if it had to stop on it, um, but. Not heard anything beyond that. So maybe that's something we could check into or whatever with the school board. We could certainly yeah. uh, see if they'll work with us on that legally. I don't think we'd be able to prohibit that from using it, but um, we could see if we could work with them on it. Okay, if it's their policy. Okay. So I just have one other slide, and I think we've covered we've covered most of these. Um, and then I did want to go back on a, a few um, items. As far as some of the, the manuals specify 400 vehicles a day as, as um, one of the, the top volumes to look at for, for a gravel road before you consider other, other methods. So um, we probably have, have a couple that are, that are close to that right now. Um, we have seen, seen some go down as well. Um, and um, let's see, we've talked about the goal condition level. So, so looking at what a level four would would be um, which lends more towards the re weather responsive um, program versus the set four times a year, or in addition to uh, the pothole response will be be more in line with the with those weather responsive um, methods, and then uh, we'll also start looking at at some ideas for capital improvements. Um, the Lively Road was one um, that we'd identified. There's there's a couple areas, other areas that uh, that we'll we'll look at further for for capital improvements. Sarah, would you mind rolling back one last time to the slide with the uh, secondary ditch? So just as as we're we're talking about this and we're considering how we want to maintain our roads, what you see there that uh, that secondary ditch is it really acts like a, a curb. Uh, a curb and gutter with no drainage. So what it ends up doing is it ends up flowing into the, into the side and then washing back out onto the road, especially once the crown disappears. Um, that destroys the road. With, with, with any time you have a puddle on a gravel road, any time a, a vehicle travels through it, it immediately displaces the smaller uh, particles in there and you create the, the, um, the potholes or the washboarding. Um, to be able to avoid that and, and get to some of the fours and fives, we're going to have to deal with that and also the, some of the driveways. So what, are, what that's going to involve is shearing that off. Um, we're going to, that's got to be removed, and that's understand that there's going to be some pushback from people whose properties are beautifully manicured, and we can't make it to the, uh, to the, the, the water does not make it to the, uh, to the ditch. Those are going to have to be removed to be able to stop that from deteriorating very quickly. Yeah, that makes uh, um, also, when you when you do that, isn't that a natural byproduct? The road gets widened, right? Every, when, and so, you know, we hear that. I, I'm sure that that's not our intention. But as we maintain these roads, they do, in some places, get widened. They get widened. They get deeper. We have places that, uh, that have become six foot deep because you start losing the contours um, with each time you scrape it. It fills in the gaps and you scrape off the top. So some places are six inches deep, some places are six feet, six feet deep. Um, and that's one of the benefits we're going to have from the, the recent survey we just had. Sarah, can you just show the driveways too real quick? And then I apologize. I don't mean to drag this on. Um, so this is, this is a major issue for us as well and something that you don't normally deal with on, on some of those larger gravel roads. And it's these sloping driveways that come into the gravel roads. 
And what ends up happening is all of the runoff from the homes, and the, a lot of these are large homes, they drain out onto the, the, imper the impervious surface of their pavement, and that all comes running down that driveway on that steep incline into the road and washes straight across. Um, ideally, they shouldn't. They should drain off into the side ditches through some sort of drain mechanism that could be installed. Some of them have them if you, if you travel on some of the gravel roads and it, it empties down in. But this is another impact that we have to consider as a city. You have multiple driveways that, that cause this issue, bypass the ditch altogether, and empty right into the road. And it's something that, that is another issue that we have to make sure we attack when we're, uh, when we're talking about maintaining, getting up to the, that four level. I don't know what the solution to that is um, other than having cooperative homeowners or creating new design regulations for new driveways that are put in when we have new permits. But that will be an existing issue that we're going to have to deal with. Is that private property? It'd be the right of way. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh. Joe. So, sir or Stephen, we've got to seek some kind of standards or some <laughs> kind of guidance or some kind of best practices when it comes to some of this stuff because Everything that you're talking about, I think, is very, very important, and it points to some of the challenges that we have by maintaining um, gravel roads. Now, some gravel roads make perfect sense. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit worried right now about the volume of traffic on some of these roads and our ability to justify the fact that we're leaving them as gravel roads. The other thing that I need to understand, and I think you guys need to be able to present to us, is what is our return on investment look like if we were going to convert a road because as you know our responsibility to our citizens is to make sure that our their tax dollars are being spent on the best thing possible in the most judicious manner possible and if it cost us 2x to maintain a gravel road because of the traffic volume because of where it is because of the fact that it's now a connector when it used to not be a connector we have a responsibility to our other citizens to do what's right and to turn that into a road that is more maintainable, is more economical, all those things. And trust me, I know what I'm saying when I say this. It's not going to be a good thing. A lot of people expect the road to always be a gravel road the same way a lot of people expect other things to stay the way they are. But we somehow transition from what we we're using a road for and how a road used to be characterized as something different and we need to understand that we and we have a responsibility to manage it right Laura? oh no i was just going to ask about the um aggregate that we're using now <coughs> and if you're seeing an improvement with that i mean is it because it, does that hold better with the weather and the rain that's yeah, yeah that's the intent that with the, the fewer fines that those the mm -hmm. The heavier aggregate will stay in place, and there'll be less less fines wash out. So. And I'll just make a statement. One thing we have to realize: there can be unintended consequences. The better you make the roads, the more yeah. traffic they may get. And, so, but the, again, there's a balance with the improvements on the other roads that hopefully will offset that. Um, okay. Anything else? Um, I did mention to the uh, to Steve, city manager. Um, we, we've gotten some feedback, you know, going on talking about the uh, the trail plan and and a lot of traffic on some of our gravel roads, specifically Wood Road area and whatnot. And uh, I know we are are um, planning on coming back to our public with some. Uh, some feedback and some meetings and whatnot, but that's uh, obviously taken a, a little bit longer than we expected. So I wanted to kind of run it by the council to see if there was any interest in possibly uh, <clears throat> maybe even next meeting having a work session where we could just get some feedback and, and update some, even though we don't have any permanent answers or future answers yet, uh, but from our citizens, if there'd be interest in uh, putting that on our agenda uh, real soon to Again, just uh, kind of update our citizens, even though we, it'll be a temporary update, if that makes sense. I think our next agenda is pretty light, um, if I recall. And um, I, there's no issue with adding a work session on after a, uh, after a meeting, right? No. <coughs> we uh, staff can prepare some, uh, some background information um, to bring you all up to speed on at least 
how we got to where we are today. Um, I think most of it's done already, so it should be quite simple. And um, might be a good opportunity for to hear from everybody involved. Yeah, so is council okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Get it. We'll get it done. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. I assume there's no more public comment. No, sir. That's all. All right. Then we'll adjourn. Good meeting.